welcome to Heart Talk India. For over two decades, my guest has been thought of as India's foremost historian, but recently she's also been considered perhaps its most controversial. On the one hand, she's won awards from most of the world's prestigious universities. On the other hand, she's become the figure of a hate campaign on some websites. Does the explanation lie in the fact that perhaps history today in the 21st century has become the new battleground of Indian politics? Here to give us her answer is Professor Ramila Thapar. Professor Thapar, 40 years more or less have passed since you originally published your Penguin History of India, and since then the book has come to be considered perhaps the best known in Indian history. What first drew you to the subject? I suppose uh, one goes back to school days with a question like that. And I was, when I was in school, rather torn between uh, history and botany. Um, and finally, history prevailed. And I think the reason for that was that I was in school at a time when we were all deeply seeped in the anti-colonial national movement. My generation was the generation that grew up on the cusp of independence. And consequently, our concerns when we emerged out of school, and my, my last year of school was 1947, our concerns were really around issues like, uh, what is it that makes an Indian identity? Because we were worried about the identity that had been imposed on us by uh, colonial thinking. Uh, and secondly, what is it that one is going to do with this freedom? How, how is Indian society going to emerge? out of the colonial period into a period of freedom. So in a sense, history was part of a quest to the answer, who are we and where are we going? That's right, yes. Who are we and where are we going? And uh, the quest was framed very much in terms of who are we as Indians? And the Indian component was absolutely at the forefront. As opposed to how the British had thought of Indians up till then. That's right. So and you were looking for an Indian national identity. That's right, yes. And the British had thought of India up till then as Indian society consists of two monolithic communities, the Muslim and the Hindu, perpetually antagonistic. In which case, how did you respond last year when campaigns started on several websites against your selection for the Kluge chair at the US Library of Congress, where they said of you that you were an Indian traitor? They called you a Hindu-hating Marxist who could stoop to anything to denigrate her country. Well, I must confess that I was not too surprised by this, because let's uh, also remember that over the last five years, ministers of the BJP government abused us day in and day out. Us is historians, historians like Historians like myself. Uh, and the abuse was often very vulgar. Anyway, uh, so this kind of thing appearing on a website was not something that was startling. Except that it wasn't just your work that they were attacking. Much of the vitriol, if I can use that word, was directed at your personality. Here's another one of the quotations. The stupid lady should be stripped of her nationality. Kick her out. The kick should be of such force that she remains dead on the ground. Yeah. You well, uh, let, me, let me just go back to the petition and say that when the petition appeared, uh, there was at the same time, and I think this is important to keep in mind, there was within hours an international reaction from academics and intellectuals and writers and so on and so in forth. In support of you. In support of me. Letters, emails by the hundreds that came to the Library of Congress, they were quite startled by what had happened. And of course that's not surprising because you are perhaps India's best known historian, but the point that surprised everyone was that for a section of the community, you'd become a hate figure. Yeah, well, that didn't surprise me, because the point is that the kind of history that some of us have been writing, and I suppose my history in particular, uh, was a threat. It was a threat to this Hindutva-oriented group that was behind this petition. You mean you were challenging things that were dearest to them? I was challenging things that they were taking as given truth. And not only I, but others like me have been challenging that. Let's, let's explore a little mm -hmm. the divisions and differences between you and historians like yourself on the one hand, and those who subscribe to what perhaps is called the Hindutva right-wing viewpoint. Are your differences merely differences of interpretation, or do you also differ on facts? Both. Uh, 
Uh, let me give you an example. The main contention, for example, in, in uh, the Hindutva view, uh, which, which opposes what we say and describes us as <laughs> given in this description. Um, for example, the, uh, the whole question of the Aryan problem. Now here, it's a very basic question in the study of Indian history relates to the early beginnings, not the foundations, but the beginnings. You're talking of the question, who are the Aryans, where did they come from? The whole question of what was it, the Vedic culture that is talked about. And the differences are so enormous that we have differences, for example, on the issue of chronology. They will argue that the Vedic texts have to be taken back to the third millennium BC. We say no, we accept the generally accepted date, which is 1500 BC, so there's a difference of 1500 years. They would like to argue that the Indus cities, or the Harappan cities, to give them the broader name, uh, were all authored by the Aryans, whoever the Aryans were, uh, and the Rig Veda is reflected in the archaeology of the Harappan cities. Well, would I be correct in saying that, in a sense, one of the fundamental differences between you and them is that you don't believe the Aryans were necessarily indigenous to the subcontinent? Yeah, but this is the, the theory that's been going on for the last 40 years. Uh, some of us have been arguing that, in fact, what happened at that time was that there was a lot of toing and froing across the Indo-Iranian borderlands, and you had people coming in and settling down, and there were cultures that were mixing and merging. And it was out of this mixing that you get the evolution of a culture that we have started calling the Vedic culture. Whereas for the Hindutva viewpoint, it is essential to believe that the Aryans are indigenous because otherwise there's an implication that somehow Hinduism, which flows from the Aryans, came from outside. The implication is, is actually much deeper than that. The implication goes back to the writings of Savarkar, who argues that the Hindus are the, not only the descendants of the Aryans, linear descendants, and therefore have an ancestry of 5,000 years, uh, but they are the primary inhabitants. And the Muslims and the Christians whose religion comes from territories outside the boundaries of British are India, outsiders. are outsiders, are aliens. So in order to support that thesis of the Muslims being foreigners, the Muslims and the Christians and the Parsis as well, in fact, uh, mm -hmm. you have to prove that the Aryans were indigenous. And in fact, the consequence of your position on the Aryans is the argument made against you that you are minimizing the Hindu influence on India's ancient past. That's the charge well, they make. Well, that, that's, that's a charge which is a completely incorrect charge. You dismiss it totally. Totally, because, I mean, I've just written a 550-page book, which was published last year, called Early India, which is all about what is popularly known as the Hindu history of India. So you're saying that your critics are not just wrong in terms of their facts, but they're also wrong in terms of their understanding of your position. Yes, and not only of my position, but I'm also arguing, and many of us are arguing this, that the, this is an attempt, the, the position of my critics is an attempt to go back to 19th century colonial history, because all of this was said by British authors in the 19th century. So it's not it's an advance, about. it's a retrogression. It's a retrogression. Now, your critics also say that your school textbook on medieval India mm. tends to ignore the Hindu-Muslim -Muslim conflict, which they believe characterizes that period. In other words, you minimize the role of Hindu-Muslim con uh, conflict, they emphasize it. Well, this again is a case of, you know, not uh, uh, reading and being up to date with what has been written on the so-called medieval period of uh, Indian history. Which so is again, they're out of date? Uh, they are out of date in the sense that, uh, you know, our position is, uh, not the, the position that, that many historians now take is that one doesn't see this period as the Muslims are the conquerors, the Hindus are those that resisted them. But one sees it as the creation of communities. The Muslims, after all, the Muslims, came in in various ways. They were traders, they were pastoralists, they were conquerors, uh, they were missionaries, and they created different kinds of communities all over the subcontinent. And what we're interested in is what was the relationship between the new communities and the older communities, how did they interact, and how did communities evolve, fresh communities, out of this interaction? Let's pick an example mm. from your most recent book published earlier this year on Mahmud of Ghazni's 11th century raids on the Hindu temple at Somnath. Mm -hmm. For your opponents and your critics, mm 
that in a sense has crystallized their criticism of you. Mm -hmm. What is the central message of that book? The central message of that book, let me take a little time to explain it because I think it's important, uh, is that I was concerned with a problem that many historians today are concerned with. An event takes place or you study a location and you study it from a multiplicity of sources and you discover that the sources are saying different things and this is why it becomes a kind of Rashomon story or as somebody said it's like the story of the giants of the blind man uh, the six blind men touching different parts of the elephant um, and I was interested in this as a historiographical exercise what does a historian do when you have these diverse uh, s narratives about an event. That is how it started. And when I presented this paper at a seminar, which was the origin of the book, uh, people said to me, but none of the sources that you are quoting talk about a Hindu trauma. And therefore, the next step in the study was to go into the question of when the trauma was created. In a sense, that's where the controversy begins. Mm. Because for generations of Indians, Mahmud Ghazni's raids on the temple of Somnath came to be a symbol of the trauma that Hindus had suffered at the hands of their Muslim conquerors. It's become, in a sense, an Indian cultural belief. Yet your book suggests that contemporaneously, at the time, this trauma wasn't experienced. And it also suggests that perhaps this trauma is a product of later interpretation. Yes, it, it, it doesn't suggest that. It states that very categorically. But in doing so, you're challenging perhaps the most cherished belief there is, the most commonplace belief there is. I am not challenging a commonplace belief. I am questioning the way in which that belief was created. And, and its what authenticity. I'm, and, and, uh, and its authenticity. I, I'm challenging the fact that the belief was not created at the time of the event or many centuries later. In fact, the earliest reference that you have to this is in a debate in the British House of Commons in 1843. So, so the corollary is that this belief, in a sense, is the British reading of Indian history, which Indians have accepted as authentic and true. Precisely. And precisely. you're, in a sense, to use a colloquial phrase, debunking that. What? Debunking? The origin of that belief. You're saying that, look, this is not a true belief. This is something that this happened This is something that was created. Yes, that's but what But your I'm critics arguing. point out something more. They say that your book suggests that far from being motivated by iconoclasm, leave aside hatred of Hinduism, many of Mahmud Ghazni's followers were simply fortune seekers there for loot. Mm. And some of them possibly could even have been Hindus too. Yeah, we don't know who his soldiers were in his army. But what we do know is that at this time and for a couple of centuries before, uh, for example, the Hindu kings of Kashmir were recruiting Turks as mercenaries in their armies. And the Afghan uh, rulers were recruiting Indians in their armies. So there could have been Indians in the armies that Mahmoud Ghazni know, brought? We know for sure that there were Indians in Mahmud's army in Afghanistan. There was an Indian general by the name of Tilak. And Mahmud used the Indian army, of which he was very proud, by the way, uh, for his campaigns in Afghanistan. Whether those soldiers came into the northwest of India on his raids, one doesn't know. The problem, of course, is that your critics say that all of this amounts to an attempt to exonerate Mahmud Ghazni. Let me quote to you Chandan Mitra from the Pioneer, June this year. The entire exercise was undertaken to exonerate Mahmud Ghazni of his criminal offense in ransacking this splendid shrine. Uh, well, that's his reading of it. The point is that uh, my projection of Mahmud is that he is a very petty man who's trying to build a Central Asian empire in which he doesn't succeed. Uh, as regards the attack on the Somnath temple and this criminal offense, it is curious that it's not mentioned in any sources except for the Persian sources. But what do There's you say total to silence. But what and do you I say to people who say that maybe it's not mentioned in the sources, but this has become a cultural belief that is not just intrinsic to the way Indians look at their history, but it's a cherished belief. And in debunking it, you're quoting controversy. No, I'm not quoting controversy. Historians don't con court con controversy. Controversy is thrust upon them by media people and by public opinion. What about Let's the view that, that, in a sense, this was destined to be a red rag to the Hindu bull? Historians are not uh, tailoring their history to, to Hindu bulls or Muslim bulls. Uh, 
uh, let me say that the, the, the person whom you've quoted as saying that I was exonerating Mahmoud of Ghazni says in the same review that my scholarship cannot be faulted. Now, this raises a very fundamental question as far as the historian is concerned, that you go into the sources, the sources tell you something, and the implication of what the sources are telling you or your reading into the sources or what is being explained and narrated in the sources is a position which is contrary to the generally held position. And if now, it is so, moment, you're saying also that that is a consequence that they have to bear with. Th that is a consequence, and, and the historian then has to decide, do I take my argument to its logical conclusion and say, not that I am creating a controversy, the historian is never creating a controversy, but say that I am presenting an alternative explanation. And it is for people to read the book and decide whether that explanation holds or not. The controversy, in a sense, you're suggesting is created by those who don't like the interpretation. Precisely. And wish to rebut it in terms of either facts or in terms of its validity. And generally also by, uh, after not reading the book, but just hearing about it. This subject, of course, links up with the question of the relationship between history and memory. What do you say to those who argue, as some historians mm -hmm. do, that unlike Western history, which is recorded and written, Indian history is oral, it relies on memory, what's sometimes called the Shruti tradition, and in minimizing the role of memory in the way in which you interpret history, you're also minimizing Hindu influence on India's past. No, this is, this is simply not true. Uh, Indian history is not based only on an oral tradition. We have a large number, a large category of written sources um, pertaining to not just the record of the present, but pertaining to ideas about the past as well. So In this fact, is a false defense of their position? This is a false defense. And, and this again goes back to a colonial uh, view of uh, the Hindu past, saying that the Hindus didn't have a sense of history. Once again, a regression rather than a progression. Once again, a regression. And what many of us are now looking at is the whole question of what form did, uh, if you want to call it the Hindu, the Hindu, the Buddhist, the Jain, all the people that were writing about the past in the early period, in the pre-Islamic pre period, what form did that writing and that view take? And it, it is a very viable historical question. What about connected to this, the relationship between history and belief? If hundreds of millions of Hindus believe that the Lord Ram was born at a particular stop, a spot in a Yodhya, can history disprove it? It's, it's a different, uh, there are two different categories altogether. There's, there's no linkage between history and belief. Belief is something that you have which arises out of 101 reasons, and it can be as full of fantasy as you want it so to be. So belief and history, in a sense, to use a colloquial phrase, are non-sequiturs? Yeah. The history is based on evidence, on analysis, on causal relationships, on argument. Belief is a question of faith. Belief is a question of faith. And, history and this was exactly the issue that some of us raised in the Jan Ram Janamhumi movement. But you also say that history can neither challenge nor can it prove faith. They are separate. No, because history is not concerned with saying this is the truth about the past. That again is something that is out of date. History gives history, interpretations. History is concerned with trying to understand the past. Then how do you respond to the fact that in recent years, courts in India have called upon the archaeological survey to dig beneath the ruins of the Babri Masjid to see whether at some point in time a Ram temple stood there? Can archaeology definitively answer this question? Or is it, in a sense, a mistaken quest? I think it's a mistaken quest, because the point is that archaeological artifacts are as subject to interpretation as textual facts or textual observances. Uh, archaeologists vary in the way in which they excavate a site and in the way in which they read what they excavate. And already, uh, despite the fact that the report is supposed to be under wraps, it's doing the rounds amongst archaeologists, and already there is a very divided opinion as to what has actually been found. And there's not going to be a clear answer, therefore? There's not going to be a clear answer. In which case, it seems to many people that today in India, history has become the new battleground of politicians. In a sense, what Hobsbawm says when he says, historians have become central to politics. How deeply do you regret that? 
Well, I think, no, I think that this has got something to do with, you know, what is the national agenda. After all, in the 60s and 70s, when economic growth was the central issue, the economists were the ones that were in the battleground. Uh, in the 90s, when with Hindutva and the rewriting of Hindu, of, of history in a, in a particular way has become uh, the, the, the national agenda, or had become the national agenda, historians were in. Tomorrow, when there is a confrontation on caste, the sociologists are going to have to move in. In other words, depending upon what the political agenda is, the appropriate academic and his field, or her field, becomes the battleground. Where that field is politicized. Yes. So there's a sense in which, given the politics of India today, the politicization of Indian history is inevitable. Or was it given, given the kinds of politics that we've been through, now whether this will change or not is, is uh, a matter for discussion, but given the kinds of politics that we've been through in the last five years, yes, it was inevitable. We have, unfortunately, only very little time left. How then does one free the teaching of history from politics? One frees it by, first of all, uh, maybe forcing the politician and the media people to read history that's being written more recently of which they are oblivious. You mean many of those creating controversy are actually ignorant? Absolutely ignorant. Uh, those that accuse us of being Marxists, for example, know nothing about Marxism and wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a Marxist reading of history and a non-Marxist reading of history. But what about the problem of school textbooks, which has become a controversy? That is crucial. And there, um, again, I'd like to take a little time on this. I think it's very important that two things be done. First of all, I think that it's very necessary that educational institutions and educational form should be made statutory and procedures should be established with a near legal uh, function. And secondly, so that, so, so that you, know, you don't get this uprooting of education that we've witnessed as a nightmare in the last five years. Uh, secondly, the NCRT should take it upon itself to evaluate books and books all down the line in all kinds of schools, religious schools, organ cultural organizations, and so on, in order to make a differentiation between that which is a catechism, as is the Hindutva history, and that which is, in fact, a free, open, widely debated history that gives you an insight into the past. In other words, we need to evaluate and analyze and constantly be on guard. Yes. Professor Thapa, thank you very thank much you. for talking to Hard Talk India. Thank you.